So of course, I want to start by saying thank you everyone for joining. My name is Cody Armstrong, and today we're discussing surfaces and curves in Onshape. And so the goal with this webinar is really to get you familiar with the building blocks that you'll need to create some of the more complex surfaces that we have in Onshape. So we're going to go over surfaces and the curves, the underlying curves that drive those surfaces. So that's the idea behind this webinar. As I always say with these webinars, I really encourage you to ask any questions that you'd like. There's a questions section in the GoToWebinar control panel. I have it up here. If you have any questions, I will do my best to stop and answer the questions before we end things today. It's going to be a short webinar. We're really going to focus solely on the curve creation tools and the surface creation tools that you'll need you know, to get some of those more complex shapes. So without further ado, let's dig in. So I want to start with just a simple agenda. Um, the goal today is really just to introduce you to surface modeling tools. So um, if you're new to Onshape surface modeling or you're new to surface modeling in general, uh, really the idea is just to introduce you into the surface modeling tools and the curve creation tools that you'll need to get those smooth surfaces. Right? Um, and I'll show you a few examples of where they're used. I have a few different examples of the various tools and situations where they make sense to use them. And I'll show you some examples of those. As always, with all the webinars, again, feel free to ask any question that you'd like, and I'll do my best to stop and answer the questions from time to time. So without further ado, let's jump right into things. So first question that often gets asked when I bring up this topic is, what is surface modeling? How is it different than anything else in Onshape? And it is a bit of a different workflow, and it's typically involved when you have more complex shapes, more complex contours that you have to create. Um, and, you know, you, you've heard the term advanced shapes or complex shapes, but it's, you know, generally reserved for those types of, uh, that type of geometry, a more organic style of shapes. And it's created using a combination of curves and surfaces, like, like I mentioned earlier. So a lot of the focus is going to be not just surfaces, but also the curves that we need to make those surfaces. But in general, you would go to surface modeling in areas where, you know, the solid modeling equivalent just isn't as easy to create or um, if that workflow just doesn't make sense. Uh, a lot of what surface modeling is, is thinking about your model in terms of faces and not necessarily as enclosed volumes. You know, when we think about solid modeling, everything is an in enclosed volume. You know, the extrude, revolve, sweep, loft, the defaults all create those solid parts. In the case of surface modeling, it's a bit different, and you tend to think of surface modeling as a combination of faces, working through creation of faces. And so that's the way I would think of this as you're first getting started. If you're just new to, to surface modeling, trying to understand why is it different than solid modeling, that's probably a few of the things that I would point out. So that's a simple explanation into surface modeling. I'm going to go over an example of how we create them in just a bit, but I want to go over real quickly at a high level, what are the tools that you're going to need to know? So as I mentioned before, I think there are a few very important curve tools that are kind of critical to know if you're doing a lot of surface modeling. Bridging curve, projected curve, composite curve, 3D fit spline. Those are all curve tools that will be very helpful in creating the surface that you'll need later on. The reason these are helpful is because they allow you to do a lot of things. They allow you to define the boundary of a surface. They allow you to create a curve that's you know, continuous with other edges of the model or even curvature continuous with other edges of the model. So um, you know, these curves are very much the foundation of the surface features that you're going to create later. So the first four there, bridging curve, projected curve, composite curve, 3D fit spline. I'm going to go over an example of each one of those, but I think the big thing to stress is each one of those has its place when we talk about how to create surfaces. So I'm going to start there. Then we're going to get into the surface-specific functions. I'm going to stick with the more popular surface modeling tools, namely loft, fill, and enclose. Those are the tools um, that you'll need to know in order to get successfully, you know, using surfacing. All right. So let's jump right into things. As I mentioned before, feel free to ask any question that you'd like in the questions section in the GoToWebinar interface, and I'll do my best to stop and answer them from time to time. As I mentioned before, I'd like to go through each one of these tools and explain where I think they're most valuable. And I want to start with bridging curve. In my opinion, this is probably one of the most powerful curve commands we have in Onshape. And it's namely because it allows you to do, uh, to create curves 
that have the you know relationships to other geometry right and one of the most important aspects of surface modeling is ensuring the surface you're creating is continuous with the faces around it, it has a smooth transition from uh, you know surrounding faces so that's where bridging curve can re be really helpful essentially bridging curve is a curve that's generated between any two selections and those selections could be edges they could be points the real power of this uh, of the bridging curve command is the ability to match tangent and match curvature right you also have a match position option which i'll cover in a second but the ability to say, I want you to match the tangency of the surrounding edges or the curvature of the surrounding edges, that's really where the power comes in. Because then I can use that bridging curve as a loft guide or an edge for my fill. And I know that the curve itself is curvature continuous, so the surface that results from it will be. So that's the idea behind bridging curve. And, and you can think of, you know, I have these two things and I need to create something that joins them. The bridging curve allows me to create that entity that defines the loft, defines the fill later on. So let me give you an example of where I think this is useful. I'm going to be jumping around a lot in this, so bear with me. I'm going to jump back and forth between a few different examples here. But one of the examples I like to show for bridging curve is something like this road bike frame. And if we take a look more, more specifically at this face, if we take a look at, in this case, loft 4, you can see if I roll back to a certain point in this design, the way this was, was designed is initially these were two separate pieces. I'd have the seat post of the bike frame and then I have this the crossbar here. And what I need to do is create a surface that bridges this gap and gives me a smooth transition from this edge to this edge. Now, if I just go to loft and I select surface and I just select the edges, I do not get a smooth transition between the two. So if I just go to loft command, select my edges, just as I would in a normal solid loft, you can see I get a transition, I get a loft, but it's a sharp transition, which is not what I would be looking for. There are things that we can do in the loft command. We can add, define a start and end you know, condition to, to further control this shape. But one of the easiest things to do to give you the utmost control is create a bridging curve. Now, all of the curve commands that I'm going to discuss here are under the same dropdown. So you'll see 3D fit spline, projected curve, bridging curve, composite curve. They're all together in that category in the toolbar. And in this case, I'm going to start with a bridging curve. Right? So I'll select bridging curve. And the way this works is very simple. You select the two things that you want to create a curve to bridge between. And in my case, I want to create a curve that bridges the seat post with this crossbar, right? Now, I could create a relatively simple curve. For instance, if I say match position, and I just click on two points, a point here and a point here, what I end up with is, forgive me, just a straight curve, right? So just a simple uh, curve between two points. But what I really want, and what the power of this command is, is the ability to define as match tangent or match curvature. So if you're looking for curvature continuous transitions, if you're looking for tangent uh, transitions, these are the options you'll want to select, match tangent or match curvature. Now, when you select match tangent, you'll want to select an edge of the model rather than a point, right? Because you want to say, I want the curve tangent with this edge. So I'll select this edge, then I'll click second side, again, match tangent, then select this edge of my seat post. And what will happen here um, is I will get a smooth transition, in this case tangent transition, between the two edges that I've selected. Right, so it gives me that smooth transition. I can manipulate it if I wanted to. If I wanted to shift the bias left to right, I could. If I wanted to extend the, the magnitude of the tangent transition, I can by grabbing and dragging or just entering in a value over here. But the important thing to stress is, again, the match tangent or the match curvature will give you that smooth transition between your selections. Now, why is this curve important? Why is this uh, transition important? Well, if you remember, we went to create our loft. We wanted a smooth curve between these two shapes. Well, when we created our loft, it was a sharp transition. But if I create uh, a couple of bridging curves, 
uh, then I can easily say, use those curves to define the shape of my loft. And that's really where the power comes in. So this is very much a, a tool that helps you build a loft or a fill later on. Now I'm going to do this one more time. I'm going to select bridging curve. We'll select our first side will be this edge, right? And our second side, let's say that edge there. Second side will be this edge. And what you'll see is, again, I get that nice, smooth transition from the two selections that I've made, right? In this case, tangent transition. I can hit OK. Now I have two curves, this one and this one, that can drive the loft that I create later on. Right? Now I'm going to go over loft in a little bit greater detail, but I think it's relatively straightforward if you have experience with the loft command. The only real difference is in surface modeling, you choose the option for surface. And it doesn't matter whether it's extrude, revolve, sweep, or loft. There's this option at the top for surface. And that's how you take the same basic extrude, revolve, sweep, loft commands and turn them into surface parts. Right? So I choose surface. And I just select the contours that I want to loft between. These are the same contours that I selected a moment ago, essentially these two edges between our bike frame. And by default, you'll be given that same sharp transition we saw a moment ago. The power of those curves comes in when we define guides. Right? So when we define guides, I can then go in and select edges. And now the loft itself is following those guides, those curves we created a moment ago. So in this case, in this example, the bridging curve feature is really just a feature that allows us to define our loft better and more clearly, right? So that's the way to think of it. We're using that bridging curve as a tool to help us with guides in the loft command. And in this case, you can see I have a much smoother transition between the seat post and, and the, the crossbar here because of those curves that shape the loft, right? And that's the important thing to stress. All right, so that's a simple example of a bridging curve. The key thing to keep in mind with bridging curve is you define your first and second side, and you define whether you want it to be a tangent transition, a match curvature, or just a simple match position. Match position will give you just a straight line curve between the things you've selected. Very useful, again, for defining guides in a loft. That's probably one of the more common use cases. Or edges for a fill. And we'll go over fill command in just a bit. But essentially, it's a way of defining a boundary for your loft or your fill and, and controlling that shape that's created from those commands. Right. So that is bridging curve. Bridging curve is a very powerful feature, something that you know a lot of heavy surface modeling users will use quite often. If you ever have a situation where you need to create some kind of a bridge feature between two things, this is probably the easiest tool for you. So that is bridging curve. Let's move on to the next one. The next tool in my list is projected curve. And essentially projected curve creates a 3D curve at the intersection of two sketches, right? Two 2D sketches. Again, it's very useful uh, for loft guides. It's very useful for edges and a fill. It has the same kind of use cases as bridging curve in the sense that it allows you to easily define a three-dimensional boundary. Um, now, projected curve is a bit different in that you are often required to create two separate sketches to drive that shape. Right? And the way I would think of projected curve is if you were to take one sketch and extrude a surface, and you were to take another sketch and extrude a surface, right where they meet, right where they intersect, that three-dimensional curve where those two sketches intersect is a projected curve. Right? And that's essentially what you get with the projected curve command. Again, I think is most useful for defining edges for a lo uh, loft or, or a guide. So let me tell, uh, give you an example of how I might use this. If you take a look at the toothbrush, and more specifically, the outside contour of the toothbrush, you notice this is the kind of defining uh, shape around the outside. And you can see it's a three-dimensional curve. Right? That curve was created using a combination of two sketches. Again, the projected curve warrants two sketches in its creation. So what I'd like to do is roll back to a point where none of this existed, and show you how you might get this shape. 
In this example, we have two sketches. I mentioned before, projected curve very much dependent on having two sketches and finding that intersection. And you'll see one is you know here on, in this case, the top. In this case, one is on the front plane. So what I want is I want the intersection of this curve and this curve. So if I were to extrude these two until they met, that three-dimensional intersection is the projected curve. Right, so just like I explained earlier, under the drop down, under the, all of the curves, you'll find projected curve. Here, if I choose projected curve, I can select both sketches. It's rather simple. Select the first sketch, right? Click in the second sketch box, then select the second sketch. What will happen is a 3D curve will be generated at the intersection of those two sketches, right? So rather straightforward. Again, you're just selecting two sketches, and it finds that projected intersection and creates a curve at it. If I hit the green check OK, roll forward, you'll see that curve is later used to define the outside shape of the toothbrush. And that's really where it's most valuable. Now I have this three-dimensional curve that can define the boundary for my fill, or it can define a guide for my loft. Uh, but I have something to select in that case. So that's another example where, again, you're using the curve to drive the surface later on. The curve is kind of the core building block for you know the more complex surface shapes that you'll create. A toothbrush is a good example of that. So again, the projected curve requires two sketches. Right, you're going to select one entity from one sketch, another entity from another sketch, and it will find the projected curve between the two. Right? Now, one thing to stress about all of these curve commands is that you will find them, the finished curves that are generated, in their own list in the parts list. So if you ever need to come back later and look at curves, edit curves, delete curves, whatever it may be, um, you'll find them listed you know, under, that, under that parts list. Question, the two source curves need to be 2D only? <sighs> yes, yes. Um, because the finished result is a, a 3D curve. Um, the prerequisites are two 2D sketches. Yes, so I think short answer is yes. All right, next topic. So that is projected curve. Again, we're just taking two sketches and you know, finding the projected point where they meet, or the projected curve where they meet. So, next one on my list is composite curve. Now, composite curve, when it was initially launched, was a very big feature. Um, and, and that's because a lot of times you'll need a combination of edges or curves or, or entities to drive your loft, to drive your fill, whatever it may be. And you know, these were, were curves that were necessary. You had to create this. To be totally honest, the composite curve command isn't anywhere near as useful as it was in the past. And that's because we've made changes in commands like loft to make this much easier. Require doesn't require a composite curve. But there are still some use cases for composite curve. I'll go over an example of it, but also explain why this is not as relevant as it once was. So the way to think of composite curve is it brings together, it, 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 it's composed of multiple selections. And essentially, you select a series of things, could be edges, could be curves, could be sketch geometry, and it takes all of those things that you select and makes it one curve. So if you've ever been in a situation where, you know, I wish I could select this one thing, but it's actually a combination of multiple things, make a composite curve. And that composite curve will give you one selectable entity that makes up the thing that you want to reference. Again, I think the, the biggest defining feature here is it's great for defining loft profiles or defining guides for a loft. There's, again, the same scenarios that we discussed in the past. The important thing to stress is if you've ever had a situation where, you know, I wish I could select this one thing and that one thing would be enough, but I find myself having to select a constantly three or four or five different things, make it into a composite curve. Let me give you an example of why I think this is, is particularly valuable. If we take a look at um, the spray nozzle and how it was constructed, and more specifically, the handle on the spray nozzle, uh, 
um, what I'd like to look at is how the lofts were constructed on this side. So what I'd like to do is let's just roll back to a point of the design here uh, that makes sense. All right, so let's roll to here. So I'm rolling back in this spray nozzle design, and you can see at this stage in the design, the handle is just a surface. Right? It's just a lofted surface. It's not a solid part yet. And what I'd like to do is create a loft that encloses just a section of this handle. So say, for instance, I wanted a loft between this edge, this edge, and you know, loft between those two edges and these two edges over here. Well, by default, if I go to Loft, and I click Surface, and I just select those edges, Onshape assumes that I'm trying to loft between each selection, right? And so you're going to get some really weird things when you try to select four things when in reality you have two profiles. You know, you get some weird geometry issues because, again, Onshape thinks that you want to loft from this edge to this edge to that at that edge. So what we could do is make this edge and this edge a single composite curve so that I only have one selectable thing to reference in my in my loft. So here I'll go to composite curve, right? I'll select those two edges, hit the green check, and now I have a curve that consists of nothing but two different edges, right? But it's one selectable entity. And if we do the same thing on the other side, right, over here, now I have two curves, right, I have curve one and curve two, the most important thing is I have two selections to make for a loft, not four, four is what we had just a moment ago and that really confuses it, so if I go to loft, choose surface, and instead of selecting the edges, I select my two curves, what I'll get is this nice lofted transition between the handle, in other words, it works now, when it didn't a moment ago. You notice we only have two selections here. A moment ago I had four selections because I was selecting each edge independently. So that's a scenario where composite curve is useful. I have these you know, series of selections that I need to make and bring together into one selectable entity. That's where composite curve is useful. So in this case it allows me to create a loft of just a section of the handle rather than the entire thing or a whole bunch of independent lofts. That's what you have done in the past. So I mentioned before this is not nearly as useful as it was when it was first launched. And I want to explain what I mean by that. Composite curve still has its uses. You know, there's always those scenarios where I find myself constantly selecting two or three entities. You know, and I'd rather just make them into one composite curve, and then I can select one entity. It just saves me time. But it's not a requirement for an example like this anymore. It's just not required, and I'll explain why. If I go into the loft command, one of the changes that was made recently, uh, I shouldn't say too recently, probably uh, six, eight months ago now, is that you can actually expand on each individual selection within the loft. So, for instance, I select this edge. Right? This is the same thing we did a moment ago. Rather than selecting this edge next, I'm going to expand the selection I just made. Right? Click in this box and then select the second edge. What will happen here is your one profile will consist of two selections. That's the thing that we've changed that made Composite Curve not as relevant as it was in the past. Essentially, we save you that step. Right. And so now I can select a you know combination of curves or edges or whatever it may be in a single loft profile selection without having to create a curve beforehand. Now, one caveat I would say about this workflow is make sure that you collapse the selection before you move on to your second one, because it's going to join everything that you select into a single selection unless you go in and expand or collapse. Right? So I have two selections that make up that one profile for my loft. Now I want two more selections over here that make up the other profile for my loft. You'll notice I didn't expand, right? And that's why we're getting that error. So I'll X out, we'll expand the selection, and then select my second edge. Now that I have you know, both edges as part of that single selection, I get the same exact loft that we had using Composite Curve a moment ago.
So I hope that makes sense. Within the loft command, you can now combine multiple selections. And that's really the role of composite curve for a lot of features and a lot of scenarios. Again, there are still use cases for composite curve. If you have a situation where um, you you wish that you could just select one thing rather than selecting a combination of entities, I still think composite curve is really useful in those situations. But in some cases like this one, it's just not necessary. You can expand each selection and select as many things as you want. And it could be the same things that you would select for a composite curve. It could be edges, could be other curves, it could be sketch entities. Any of those work for these selections, right? So I hope that makes sense. The big thing to stress here is that if you're careful with the loft command, the, by careful I mean expand the selection out, you know, click in the box to say I want to add more to this selection, and then go click the geometry on a reference you don't actually have to create a composite curve anymore. So important thing to, 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 to stress there is, you know, a lot of the features in Onshape now have this ability to, to take multiple selections and make them one profile for a loft uh, or one referenceable thing, right? All right, so that is composite curve. Again, it just takes a combination of curves, edges, sketch geometry, and makes it one selectable curve that you can reference. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to the next one. The next curve in my list is 3D fit spline. Like the name implies, this creates a 3D spline through a series of points that you've selected. Now, the power in this command, in my opinion, isn't necessarily the 3D spline, it's the ability to define the start and end direction because it allows you to define a vector as a direction for your 3D fit spline. The reason that's important is a lot of times your 3D fit spline, you'll want to have a smooth transition from the, the surrounding geometry. And so the ability to say, you know, select this edge and make sure that my 3D fit spline is, has a smooth transition with that edge is a really powerful thing. Uh, so let's get into an example. I'm going to go back to that spray nozzle. And if we look at the spray nozzle handle, which right now, as I mentioned earlier, is just a surface, the bottom half isn't complete. And we need to round off the bottom half of that spray nozzle handle. What I need to do before I can start any kind of loft or fill to create that rounded end, I need to create the boundary that defines the end of the handle. And I'm going to use 3D fit spline to do that. Right? So... I'll select 3D fit spline from the toolbar, and I'll select my vertices. You select points to define your 3D fit spline. So I'll select point, point, and point, and it will route a 3D spline through those points. Right? So that's a three-dimensional fit spline being routed through the three points that we've selected. Now, in that case, it's not, in this example at least, it's not a very smooth transition. Right. What I would really like is for this 3D fit spline to have a smooth tangent transition from the edges that already exist in the handle. So, in my opinion, the power of this command comes from the start and end direction. Because then I could go in and select an edge of my model and say, I want you to be tangent with this edge. Right? I want you to start defined by that edge. So, I click start direction. I click on my edge, and it gives me a, a transition, a tangent transition from that. Now, keep in mind, it can be in two different directions. So you may have to choose the opposite direction as I have here. So I'm going to do the same thing on the end. I'm going to choose in direction, rotate this around, select this edge, and now I get that nice smooth transition from my edge into my 3D fit spline, which is, of course, going to be very important if we're going to create a smooth end to our spray nozzle handle, right? So a moment ago, I had these real sharp transitions, wouldn't work for the end, you know, to have that nice clean shape, but start and end direction give me that ability, right? So if all you need is just a, a 3D spline that passes through points, you may not use start and end direction. But if you're in a situation like I am here, where I'm concerned about that 3D fit spline having a smooth transition, Start and end direction are going to be the two most important things to define. You even have the ability to match curvature at start and end. Match curvature will give you curvature continuous transitions rather than just simply tangent transitions. Uh, if you're really looking for the utmost continuity in your surface, uh, curvature continuous is, is what you'll need. And you would check the boxes for match curvature at start or end, depending on the scenario.
but that is an example of 3D fit spline. Now I have this nice curve that I can reference. I can do a loft between this curve and this edge, or I can do a fill between this curve and this edge. I have something that's referenceable now to create the, the bottom piece of this nozzle handle. So that is 3D fit spline. Something, again, I would really stress uh, is the start and end direction. If you're concerned about having that smooth transition from surrounding faces, you'll need to make sure that there's something selected there. All right. Question. Can you control the shape of a fit spline with an equation or table of points? There's no way today in the default tools to define a, a spline based on an equation or a table of points. They're the same, same situation. However, there is a custom feature. Um, ah, forgive me, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it now. There is a, a custom feature that allows you to use equations to drive a curve. Uh, it's not a series of points. It's an equation. Um, I'm not aware of any custom features that allow you to grab a table of points. There is a curve feature that allows you to use a CSV. So if you have a CSV file consisting of a bunch of points, in theory, you could use the CSV to drive the curve shape. But neither of those commands are, are uh, in the default toolbars. They're both custom features that you'd have to add. And, and forgive me, I, I don't remember the name off, of, off the top of my head. Short answer is, is no, not in the standard toolbar, but there are custom features that allow you to create curves on equations and use CSVs to drive a curve, which is not quite a table, but most tables can be exported to CSV. So hope that answers it. All right, um, moving on. So we've discussed kind of the basic curves. I started with the curves because I think they're the foundation that you're going to need to create nice surfaces. Uh, so I think it's important to understand that first. But now that we've covered kind of the basic curves that allow you to get those shapes, uh, what do we need to actually create the surfaces? And they're really just a few key surfacing tools that I think are, are most valuable. Of course, we have extrude surface, revolve surface, sweep surface. You can generate all the kind of standard you know, uh, shapes, but a lot of times it's two commands that you'll end up using, loft or fill. Uh, loft, of course, just like the typical solid loft, allows you to loft between different profiles. Uh, fill allows you to select a boundary of edges, and it fills that boundary with a surface. Right? Those, at least in, in my experience, are the two most common surface modeling tools that you'll need. Um, and, and you know, those are really the the kind of keys to creating some of the more you know, nice, you know, um, complex contours that you're going to need. Now, there are a few keys to loft that I would stress. Loft is fairly straightforward. You select two profiles, it lofts between them. But the, the power of loft isn't necessarily in just the simple lofts. It's the ability to define a path. It's the ability to define guides for your loft. It's the ability to define end conditions for the loft. That's really where you get the, the nice ability to blend in with surrounding faces. So I'm going to go over an example of this. I've already shown you guides. Uh, we went over guides in the last example, you know, where I can define guides as, you know, the bridging curves that I did earlier. But I didn't show you loft with path. And there are other CAD software applications that have this in different places. I know, um, you know, some CAD software has this as a sweep command where you can, you know, sweep and then choose your, um, your guide for your loft. What I would like to do is show you how you might do something similar in and on shape. So let's roll back here. And what I'd like to do is loft between two sketches, sketch four, sketch five and sketch four. And this will create that, forgive me, I, I, I'm calling it crossbar, but I'm not sure that's the right name, but it, the crossbar on the top end of the bike frame here. And what's most important about this is it's not a straight transition, right? So if I just go to loft, click surface and then select you know the surfaces that I want to loft in this case this one and this one like that what I get is a sharp transition between them right so this is a the most basic of lofts right you select two profiles you get a straight loft that joins the two profiles it's a gradual transition from one to another 
But what if I wanted the loft to follow a path, you know, a curve that gave this a slight arc, for instance? That's where some of these additional options are really valuable. More specifically, path allows you to click on a path that defines the shape of your loft, right? And you can see now my loft is following that path. So there's a slight arc to the loft profile. Before, it was a, a sharp transition, a, a straight transition from one profile to the next. But by introducing this path, I can manipulate the shape of the loft from start to end, right? Now, keep in mind, the as a as general rule that I would follow, you want your, your path, in this case, just a simple arc sketch, attached to both profiles, or in the, if you have more than you know, two, uh, all profiles. So in this case, you know, I have this, you know, si simple arc, but it's constrained either with Pierce or coincident to both profiles involved in my loft. It's important to understand that it must be constrained. You know, it must be attached to the geometry that you're referencing for your loft profiles in some form or another. Um, Pierce and coincident are the two obvious ways to do that. And it just means attaching a Pierce or coincident constraint between the end point of this curve and this sketch and the end point of this curve and this sketch. And then it's selectable. But if you ever have trouble selecting a path, go back into your path sketch and make sure that you have those constraints in place, that it's actually attached to the, the profiles that you're using in your loft, right? Top tube, yes, you're right. This is the top tube that I'm making here. So in this case, the, the arc shape is given by the path. I know in other CAD applications, this is like in a sweep command in different places, but essentially gives you the same kind of function. You, you want to loft between two things and also follow some kind of path, right? So that is loft. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, our surface modeling tools are just a part of the normal features. So extrude, revolve, sweep, loft, all have an option at the top to choose surface. And you may have seen me doing this at different points. I click surface, then go in and make my selections. By default, if I just click loft, it assumes that I want to make a solid loft. It isn't until I go click surface and then go select my references that I actually get a surface loft. Important distinction. And this is that way, by the way, for extrude, right? You'll see surface, revolve, same thing, surface here at the top, and sweep, right? All of the standard modeling tools have that surface option at the top and allows you to create a surface equivalent of whatever that, you know, that feature is. So that's the most basic, I would say, you know, probably the, one of the more common surface modeling tools you're going to need is just a loft. Um, and, and the ability to control it with guides, like I showed you earlier, the ability to control it with, um, you know, paths really allow you a lot of flexibility. The loft command is, is, uh, very, very powerful in what it can do. Uh, there's a lot of options in it. We've discussed most of them. So guides, I showed you guides earlier. You can also combine guides and continuity. So I can say it's tangent to profile and has a guide that drives it, or it's matching the tangency with the surrounding selections and it has a guide associated with it. Uh, so these aren't mutually exclusive and you can really do quite a bit with all these different options. Now, one thing that I would say, one thing I would stress is it's often easiest to just start with a start and end condition to your, to your loft because that's easiest to create. I can literally just choose match tangent and it makes it tangent with the selection. If these two don't work, if these two don't give you the exact shape you're looking for, then you're going to need to look at guides. You're going to need to look at a path. You're going to need to manually create some kind of reference, right? But start and end profile conditions are probably the easiest way to shape the loft around the, the surrounding edges. Uh, without a lot of extra effort, right? Bridging curves need to be created in the example I, I gave you uh, earlier, right? Uh, path, that path sketch, that's a sketch that had to be created. So those are manual steps in order to, to create the loft shape that I'm looking for. But if you can get away with only using a start and end profile and the shape looks you know, what, like what you're looking for, you save yourself some time. Right? You don't have to actually go in and create any kind of references. Right? 
All right, so that is kind of a simple introduction into Loft. Again, Loft with the ability to define continuity, with the ability to find guides, with the ability to find a path, really is kind of a Swiss Army knife of surface modeling. It really is, um, allows you to do a lot of things, a lot of things that would be multiple commands in, in other you know, CAD applications. But it has its limitations. Um, one example is you really can't use loft if you have, say, seven edges that you want to enclose. You know, that's where a scenario where fill is the tool that you'll need to use. So let's jump into that. I'm going to go back into my slide just briefly here. And the fill command is a, this is what you'll use if loft doesn't isn't possible. And then, you know, loft is really a from to thing where I select from this selectable entity to this selectable, generate this loft. But fill is a different use case. Imagine that you've designed all these lofted edges and, and you know, extruded edges, and now you just have this gap that you need to patch in with a surface, right? That's where fill is useful. Loft isn't useful in this example. Now, it's really you know, you have to have a series of edges to define, or series of edges or curves or other things to define the boundary of the law, of the fill, right? And you can select as many edges or curves or whatever it is that you have as your reference to define a fill. So I could have 15 different edges that define the boundary that makes up my fill. Um, you know, again, so think of it that way. You take this open-ended surface that has this hole in it, and I want to patch that hole with a surface. And fill is the most easy way to do that. Now, one very powerful thing about fill is, and this is very similar to loft, you can define the continuity. Per selection, you can define the continuity. So the reason that's important is you may have 15 edges in your fill, but you really only need a smooth transition around a certain few edges, right? And everything else can be a sharp transition. A good example is that ice axe that you're seeing there. I would expect the filled surface to have a smooth transition with the, the straight base, but the top has a sharp transition, and that's okay. So in this example, I would define match tangency for those edges, and everything else would be position. So it's very similar to defining continuity in the loft. You just say, I want tangent or I want match curvature. But you can do it on a per selection basis. And that's really the key to, to point out. The last thing I would mention about this is if you're creating a fill and that fill creates an enclosed volume of the part, it will automatically convert it to a solid. That's one of the more common questions I get when we talk about surface modeling is, you know, I've got all these surface models, everything looks good, but it's still just a surface. I want a solid enclosed, you know, from my volume. If you use fill and the last step in that model is filling in a surface, it will enclose it for you. It will convert it to solid for you. So just a caveat to, to mention, I will show you enclosed next. So um, if you want to do it as a manual step later, you can. But it's important to keep in mind the fill command does that as a, as a byproduct of creating an enclosed volume. So it only works, of course, if the fill encloses everything. If it's still an open surface at the end of that fill, then, of course, you need to do a few more. Um, okay, so take a look at this ice axe. Right, and if we roll back, right, let's go to, I think it's fill four. So let's roll back to a point where we're filling in these surfaces. So I'm rolling back to this point in my design, and really this is just a series of lofts, um, fills. This is just a simple extruded surface. So rel relatively simple tools used to build this, but you can see at this stage I have this open hole in my ice axe, right? Where I can select this face on the other side because this is just empty, it's open. Another example where you might use this is imported geometry where I need to delete a face and then replace it with something that, that's better. But how do I fix this? How do I take what is this open hole in my surface model and patch in that hole with a surface? That's really where fill is most useful. Uh, again, you're not going to use this in a situation where a loft would work. Right, this is really not a loft. Wouldn't do this, and that's where fill is most useful. Again, think of it as you know, I'm defining a surface by a boundary of edges or curves or whatever it may be. So, I click fill, and I just go through and start selecting edges. 
All you need to do is select all the edges that make up your boundary. All right. So I'm just going through and selecting all these edges that make up the edges of my hole, so to speak, in my surface model. As soon as I select that last edge that creates a chain of all the selectable entities, as soon as it, it can patch in a surface, it will. Right? And you may see it there, just subtle, I'll rotate it around a bit. Now I have this surface that's been generated. If I hit OK, I'll show you it here. There is my surface. Right? Now, one problem with this surface, let's take a look here, is it's not all that smooth, right? If you look on the left side, I have this nice smooth transition from the handle of the ice axe into the head. But if I look on the right side, it's got this really sharp transition from the, the handle down here into the head. And that's not what I want. I want a smooth tangent transition from those selections. That's where independently selecting all of my... Um, continuity options is important, right? So within each selection that you've made, you'll see I have all these selections that I've made. As I mouse over them, they highlight, right? Here is where I can define what kind of continuity I want. And I'm making this definition, I'm defining this based on a per selection basis, right? So it's not a, it's not, I'm not applying tangency over to the entire fill. I'm just saying for this one selection, and by the way, you can kind of see it highlighted in yellow. When you mouse over the selection, it highlights that same edge in yellow so you can see you know, what corresponds with what. But I can say, okay, I want this to be tangency, and I'm going to rotate this around so you can see it real clearly. We'll zoom in a bit. Notice what happens to this shape as soon as I set the edge continuity to tangency. You'll see it extends that surface tangent to the edge that I've selected. Right? And I could go through and do this multiple times You know, for all the edges that, remember there's three edges along the bottom here, and I could say they're tangent here. But what I don't want is this edge up here should not be tangent. Right? That should be a sharp transition. So I really only want that smooth transition from the handle to the head down here at the bottom of the, of the fill. Right? Everything else can be positioned, and that's just fine. Uh, but that's an excellent example where continuity makes a lot of difference. Right, where it's going to make a very big difference. Now, one other thing I would mention, you can also turn on what's called ISO curves. It helps you to better understand that relationship, that tangent relationship between the geometry. Right? You can increase the count and things like that, but I often get asked the question, can I see visually see um, the curve generation and how it applies to surrounding geometry? Show ISO curves is probably the, the best way to go about that. Right? But that's really it. And then you've defined your fill. The fill command is really just defining a boundary of edges or curves. It creates a surface out of that boundary. And then you go in and define what is the continuity to those surrounding edges. It may be just a simple position. Or more importantly, you may have some situation where you need a smooth transition and tangency or match curvature becomes important. Question. This is a good question. Once the fill encloses the entire axe, is it then completely solid? Yes. Because that last fill created an enclosed volume, Onshape recognizes that as part of the fill operation and creates a solid part automatically. That's just a, a, a the way that our fill command works. Right? Um, so the short answer is yes to your question. And it's important to reiterate that. When you create a fill that encloses a volume, it automatically converts the volume to a solid. Right? That's a part of the default fill operation. Now, we also have a separate enclose feature. Right? So let's jump into that. The last one on my list, we have just a few minutes left here, is enclose. One of the last steps uh, in surface modeling is to take your surface model and convert it to a solid. Oftentimes, the end result that you want is still a solid part. We just use surfaces to get to that stage. And that's where enclose is helpful. Oftentimes, enclose is the last thing that you do to your surface model to get a solid, or the way that you take that surface model and convert it into a solid. And essentially, it takes a solid volume based on your selections and makes that a solid part. What's really different about this, the thing that I would stress about this is you can use combinations of selections to make it a single enclosed volume. 
I know a lot of users out there that will go through the effort of filling every single face and, and making sure that it's an, a watertight surface before they even try to create an enclosed, but that may not be necessary. Uh, so let me give you an example. Let's go into the steam iron and let's roll back. So this is an iron that was designed in Onshape and at a stage in this design, it was an open surface model. So we're going to roll back here. And at this point, it's just a composition of lofts and curves and, and filled surfaces, right? But you'll notice there's still some big gaps. The, the, there's nothing on the bottom here. So it's just a big empty hole in the bottom. And it's just a big empty hole in the back. So it is not a quote unquote watertight surface model, right? Now, the, the mistake that's easy to make here is to go in and enclose all of this. I can easily go to fill and fill this bottom, and I can easily go to fill and fill this back half. But I don't really have to if it's just a planar selection, right? What I can do is use a combination of references, including planes. So if we look closely, I have a plane right at the bottom here, and I have a plane that represents the end. As long as those planes encapsulate the volume, you can use them for enclose. I don't have to create that fill at the bottom or that fill in the back, right? So let me explain what I mean. First off, you'll find enclose under thicken. So that's a question I get asked often. Enclose isn't with the curve tools. It's under its own you know, option in thicken. You'll see enclose. Now, you can select faces, you can select an entire surface. I find it's easiest if I need to select a whole surface just to select the surface from the parts list rather than going through and clicking a whole bunch of individual faces. Now, I've just selected this one surface, which is every all these faces here, but of course there's some big holes in this, right? So in this example, I'll select this surface. That's a separate surface that makes up my enclosed volume. Then I'll select the planes that represent the ends too. As I mentioned before, you can also use planes. So I'll select this plane and this plane, right? And that will create a solid enclosed volume. Once it finds that given your selections, it, an enclosed volume is possible, it converts it to a solid. If I hit the green check here, you can see now I have a solid part that was just an empty surface a moment ago, or just a, a bunch of random surfaces together a moment ago. I, the big thing I would stress here, yes, you could have gone through and filled the bottom, filled the back, and made sure that everything was watertight before you tried to enclose, and that worked fine, and you could enclose very easily, but you may not have to. Uh, if you have a plane, if you have a flat face, if you have something else you can select that, and it will take the combination of your selections and look for an enclosed volume. And if it finds one, it converts it to a solid. Okay. So that is the enclosed feature. Um, this is oftentimes the, the step that you go from being a surface model to a solid, and you may have subsequent solid modeling features from this point forward, but it's kind of in a before and after. You know, before, before I do a lot of surface modeling to build up to a certain point, then I convert it to solid, and from that point forward, I'm using a lot of solid modeling on that. But oftentimes, the enclosed kind of represents the end of the surface modeling, at least traditional. Not always, but um, in most situations, it's kind of the end of the surface modeling and the start of the solid modeling in the in the part itself, right? And if you can see, we enclose this, but then we go through and create a whole bunch of extrude features and things like that, normal solid modeling features that come up afterwards, right? All right, so that is what I had planned for you. We have a few minutes left. I want to leave things open for any outstanding questions. Uh, one last thing that I want to mention before we wrap things up here if you're new to Onshape, if you're interested in learning more about Onshape, we have the Onshape Learning Center. Uh, there's lots of self-paced training. There's instructor-led training, technical briefings, hundreds of videos that you can watch on your own um, that that really you know dig down into the you know individual features in Onshape. So it maybe if you're new to Onshape or if you're learning, if you want to learn something on a certain topic, uh, che uh, check out the Onshape Learning Center. There's lots of valuable resources there. All right, so I am going to stick around and answer any outstanding questions you have, so please make sure to type them in. We have just a few more minutes, about five, six minutes here. I'll leave things open, but that's it, everyone. Thank you, and have a good day.